So now we're going to just begin to um, transition. And so I was given the task of kind of sharing with you um, a little bit about our theme. It's kind of interesting how it was developed because back in, actually it was late September, early October, um, a group of Ohio guys um, really determined that God wanted to do something. We weren't sure we were going to be able to have anything, but we decided we would press in. And as we were beginning to ponder what it was that God was beginning to speak, we felt like there was an overriding theme that has coursed through the last four or five years of these prophetic conferences. And I want to share with you first that the vision of the OPT, that's the Ohio Prophetic Truth. Several of you in here, how many have attended the meetings or are a part of the Ohio Prophetic Truth? There are several of you that have participated. But one of the things that God told us, and uh, George and Sarah, you could probably attest to this because it's been articulated in the merge as well. And that is that God is looking for those who will be a resource to others that don't have any avenue to learn about him. To learn about something we'll be talking about in, in small measure, and that is the five-fold ministry. There's a brand new intrigue for the five-fold ministry. What is that all about? Is it real or is it not? So one of the things that we determined, actually we didn't determine, I think God determined it for us, but we carry in our spirit, and that is the integrity of the prophetic voice. It became way too popular. I'm just being straight up. It became too popular. And ministries sprouted up and they became very, very, very uh, notable and I can't point my fingers at it, nor will I judge it, because that's God's business. But I want to say that we realize that we had a portion in your education at another level is all. Because of the grace and the gifting that's in our lives. Some of us are prophets. Some of us have the gift of prophecy. But God put it in our hearts to teach and equip the body of Christ so they would understand the prophetic. Last year... And the year before, we talked about Jesus' observation, what Jesus thought about the Father. Jesus is the best example we have, yes? Something that, that he spoke caught our attention. He said in John chapter 5, he says, listen, I only do what the Father shows me. And then the Son does the same. That word the same means exactly the same. Jesus had all authority. He says in John chapter 12, all authority has been granted unto me, yet I will not go from this place without partnering with the Father. He says, my Father commands me what to say. Listen to this. Command is the word. It means an objective with an expected outcome. My Father commands me what to say, and here's the message, and how to say it. This is something that's beginning to rise up. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm probably way ahead of myself. I'll be sharing some things tomorrow, but I'm just saying we, we're a little chatty at times. How about we just say what God says and leave the interpretation up to you? That's what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. That's not for me. That's for all of us. It says don't despise, don't quench the Holy Spirit. But scrutinize the prophetic word that's being spoken. And as you do, take that which is good, which means there may be a segment of that that's not so good. But I'm saying we're gaining new perspective all over again of what this prophetic is all about. So how do we do that? We do that by remaining authentic. The guys couldn't come up with that. Matt's wife, Lori, did. And as soon as we heard it, we go, oh, there it is ties right in with where God has been taking us. We're talking about what it means to remain authentic. Authentic, literally, it means to be exactly like, near the same, to do accordingly, according to the vision, the word spoken. So I want to learn that all over again. I'll be talking about a reset that's taking place. I'm not talking about revival. I'm not talking about a reformation. I'm talking about a paramount shift paradigm or your mind, a new way of thinking.
thinking. Amen? So, we are fortunate to have um, some gifted speakers with us. And uh, one of them I've known for quite some time. I've served with him years ago at an Ohio prophetic conference that used to be held here in Toledo many years ago. We served together. We were both younger. <laughs> but I learned a great deal in those days. And so Randy, he's, he's associate pastor over at Farn... Far what did I just say? <laughs> Farn something. <laughs> Not sure what that was, but Foundation Stone Christian Church over in Northwood. And he carries a good word, and he has the right heart. He has a shepherd's heart. And so he's not only a prophet, but he's also a shepherd. And so, Randy, would you come and share what God has placed upon your heart? Amen. You just see it. God. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Todd. Amen. Good to be in the house of the Lord, as always. Amen. Amen. So, as Todd was saying, you know, we... There's some crazy stuff going on in the world, right? Am I, am I living in the world that you all are living in? There's some crazy stuff happening in the world. But how many know that the Lord wants to use prophetic people? How many prophetic people we got in here in the house? Yeah, well, you're at a prophetic conference. So either like the prophetic, want to be more prophetic, hate the prophetic, or just love Jesus. If you're in one of those categories, you're in the right place. And, and here's the thing, you know, I mean, we've got, like, as Todd was saying, you know, there's some, there's some things happening in the earth today that I just want to say, it is awesome to be a part of. It's, it's a great day to be alive in the church of Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful thing. It's, it's amazing that we get to be positioned here in this day and age, because the Lord has calling his church. I think the Lord is giving his church a tremendous message. I think the Lord is, is releasing his, to his church a, a word of victory power that's going to help us to overcome in this life. How many can say amen to that? Amen. This is an opportunity for us, saints. Amen? amen. Praise the Lord. I, and so I want to share some things with you on my heart. And so this is the, this is the thing. I love the prophetic a lot. I don't know how to explain it to you other than to tell you that, that I, I, I go through a lot of prophecies. I, I do a lot of prophetic things. We do schools of the Holy Spirit and do a lot of that kind of stuff. And I just love the prophetic. I love it probably because my father loved the prophetic. And so he was a, so whether I'm a prophet, I don't know. I've been prophesied a lot of things over my life. But I know this, that I'm the son of a prophet. And so I want to tell you some things. And listen, can, check this out. He's been gone. He's, he graduated. How many of you knew my father? Anybody know Bob Coots? Praise the Lord. It's quite a bit. 22 years. Tomorrow was the day that he went and went to glory. This is incredible to me. But as a prophetic man, I, I got to live with a, a prophetic man a lot. And I'll tell you, let me just, I'm going to tell you some mistakes that I made in the prophecy, prophecy early on. Is that Okay. I mean, what, what Brother Todd said was true. We've got to scrutinize the prophetic. How many, how many know that's a good thing? If you're going to come to this microphone and you're going to prophesy the word of the Lord, how many know that you want that word to be scrutinized? It's a good thing to be scrutinized because if you don't get scrutinized and you mess up, you're going to go back to your seat and you're going to think, oh, I did really good. But if it's scrutinized and somebody says, you know what, she, I really appreciated that word. But, you know, this is, a, this is a right way to do this, a right way to deliver this. How many know you're going to grow in the prophetic? You're going to be blessed in the prophetic. You're going to have an even greater gifting released to the earth today. And that's what we need. Greater giftings working and releasing through the earth. How many know the Lord is speaking right now? Amen. So here's, this is where I want to get to. If I don't get there, I, I remember I was preaching at uh, <laughs> Pastor Ted Evans' church one time. He didn't know he was going to be, be uh, isolated already right off the, right off the bat. But I, I love to be corrected. I love to be corrected. And I was preaching at, at Pastor Ted's church one, uh, one Sunday down in Butler. And, uh, and, he, and I got done and I got finished preaching. And he came up to me afterwards. And I, and I wanted to know, I, I said, how did I do? And this, I was a young, younger preacher. It was tw over 20 years ago. And, and I said, uh, how did I do? And he said, oh, it was great, Randy. That was really good. He said, but 
it would have been nice if you'd have connected the dots a little bit for us right at the end there. And so let me, let me connect the dots for you right now in case I don't get to it later. Listen, the Father, how many, how many want the Father's heart? The Father is speaking to us right now. He's speaking in the earth, a dynamic, powerful word. But I wanted you to know something. This is the word of the Lord that the Lord has been laying on my heart. We have got to turn down our soul. We've got to turn down the noise and the clatter and the junk that's going on in, our, in the soulless realm so that we can hear the Father better. Somebody say amen. amen. The Father is speaking. The Spirit is speaking. And he wants to release something to us. I believe he's going to release something to us tonight. He wants to release his word to us in a powerful way. But we've got to turn down the noise. We've got to get better as prophetic people. We're talking to prophetic people, right? We've got to turn the noise down of the soul, turn off what we see, turn off what they're, what, what's all the information that's coming in, and learn to dial in to what the Lord is saying. Amen? Amen. I remember, my, I, I, was, I remember I was, again, I was a young prophet, and I got up and I prophesied a word on a Sunday morning, which, you know, we were wont to do all the time, and so I got up and my father was still alive at the time, and I got up and prophesied, and I, I can't even remember what I said. And I remember I come back to my seat, and I sat down in front of my, where my father sits, and he put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, don't you ever do that again. <laughs> and, I, and I thought I just prophesied a good word. And I said, okay, and I got terrified. Later that week, or, or in that, during that week, um, our senior pastor, George Bear, and my dad called me into the office. I was like, oh, for Pete's sakes, what did I do? And so I came, and they, they here's the thing, they lovingly instructed me that, listen, this was, this was a word. We, they actually felt it was a good word. But they said, this is not the word that we wanted to deliver to the church, that we need to be delivered to the church. As overseers of the church, they were guarding and watching what was being spoken to the earth. We need the right timing for some of these words that are going forth. We need not just the right timing. We need the right delivery of the timing. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Listen, we are the church. We have the word of life. We have the, the most powerful force-changing thing in the earth. I don't care what superhero movies you're watching these days. Listen, we have something way better. Come on. Nobody, nobody's watching superhero movies around here. Listen, we have something better than Superman. We have the Word of God, living and active, sharper. Say sharper. Than a two-edged sword, dividing. Say dividing. Between the soul and the spirit. Listen, can I just say something to you right now? You know, I, I think there's, there's, we need some revelation on the scripture. We're going to look at it here in a minute. But in, in Hebrews there, it's talking about the division of the soul and the spirit, like the, like the joints and the marrow, the bone, that bone joint and the marrow. Listen, it's, it's, they're not easily mixed up. The soul and the spirit are very much different, very much different. It's hard for us to tell the difference sometimes because we've got the soul speaking so loudly to us, and we like our soul. Our soul can be religious. This thing's falling off my head. Come on, fix me up, Caleb. I move around a lot. It's my glasses. See? He was making fun of my ears earlier. Clean me up. Our soul is, is, is wants certain things in life. It's, our soul wants to be satisfied. Our soul wants to be comforted. It wants to be comfy and cozy, and it wants to feel good. Sometimes the spirit doesn't make us feel good. The soul likes religious stuff. The spirit hates religious stuff. Come on. I'm talking to a bunch of spirit-filled people, right? That's going to be really important in my message. I want to be a faithful steward of what God is giving me and has given me in the earth, and I know that you do too. We do need to revolutionize, reestablish the prophetic in the house of the Lord. It has to be something that is given with pure accuracy. Good. I don't know my sister's name. Was it Joanna? Great word. Great word. That's my message in a nutshell. The hunger word, also good word. The, the thirst word, also good words. That word, my spirit jumped because I connected with it. And prophetic should do those things in your life. 
It should, it should have that thing. It should be that thing that, that man, this, is, this charged me. This made me think something. This made me feel something. The prophetic needs to be like that so that when we're out in the earth, when we're out in the world, we can have a different attitude towards the world. Somebody say amen. I remember talking about fathers. My, my dad, I, I, was going, I was young. I was probably, well, let's see, I was peewee. My first year of peewee baseball. And my dad had found out that the local team was, you know, playing baseball. And before that, we had just played the church softball teams. And, you know, I was a young kid. My dad recognized that, that hey, Randy can probably play baseball. He's, he's, he's not bad at it. And this was many pounds ago. But so he sent me out to the baseball team. And I got there. And my dad wanted me to play. And I was talking to the coach. I'll never forget Mr. Pryby. He's sitting there. And, and he asked me, he says, uh, so you want to play baseball? And I said, no. And, uh, and he, he said, well, why are you here? And I said, my dad made me come. <laughs> he said, okay, well, have a seat on the bench. And, I, and wait till practice is over and then go home. So I went home afterwards, and, and uh, my dad comes up to me and says, hey, how was uh, baseball practice? You know, would, would you, would the coach, you know, did you meet the coach, and are you on the team? And I said, and I lied to him because my soul was afraid because I did not do what the father wanted. And I said, I didn't make the team or something like that. I said, they weren't, they weren't taking any more players. My dad was not dumb like me, <laughs> 11 years old or whatever I was. And he said, okay, we're going back tomorrow. And we're going to talk to your coach. And I knew I was in trouble. We go back to the, the coach t the next day. And, and uh, Mr. Pryby, my son, has something to say to you. I'm sorry. I lied. I want to play baseball. I would like to play. Mr. Pryby, of course, let me play. Now, here's the thing. My dad saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. I was the MVP of that team that, that year. You know, and I didn't even know I could do it. But my dad saw something in me. The father sees things in you. The father sees things in you. And listen, your soul has got to learn to be turned down so that you can understand what the father is saying to you. Let me give you another one real quick. Uh, this is just about, this was at the end of last year, around October, November of last year. My father-in-law, this is a father-in-law story, so not only can your father talk to you, your father-in-law can talk to you. That's scary. For some of us, that's really scary. Oh, my father-in-law wants to talk to me. But my father-in-law was in town, and he bought himself a, a, a run-down motorcycle. He bought, and he, you know, the, the guy, there was a guy in our church who was selling the motorcycle. He had it all ripped apart and was laying on his porch. And he, you know, my father-in-law said, well, I'll buy it for 100 bucks, and I'll see if I can get it running so that when he come in town, he'd have something to drive around town on. So he did, and he got it running. But it was, it's like a, it's not a motorcycle. It's one of these Bergman 400s. I think uh, um, Bruce had one for many years. But, but you know, it's got, it's got all this casing on it. You know, it's got all these fenders. And he didn't put any of that together. It was just this, this gutted bike. And he decided it was too much work for him. So he decides to give it to me and my son as a gift. He says, Randy, here, I, I got a project for you and your son. You're going to love it. You're going to have so much fun putting this thing together. And I, and listen, I, there's a lot of things I can do in life, and there's a lot of things I cannot do in life. Some of the things I cannot do in life is mechanical things. <laughs> Some of you can relate. I'm, I'm just not good at it. I'm just not good. My father-in-law knows this, however, and I think he was trying to challenge me. So he, he bought me a toolbox, and I, I had a lot of these tools, but he had some really weird tools in this toolbox that I had, I had never seen before. I don't even know what they're for. And so he, gave, he said, you're going to need these tools. How many know the Father knows what you're going to need? How many know the prophetic is a gift, is a tool that he has given to the body of Christ, and he knows we're going to need it right now? Me and my son are attempting to put this thing together. And it's one of those things, it's trial, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, man. I mean, you put a, piece, you put a fender on, then you got another piece, and you got to take that fender off to put that piece on, to put that fender back on. They're all in a, oh man, it was a nightmare. Me and him, we're, we're up to the dashboard, and we're trying, I'm trying not to get frustrated. I'm trying to make this a, thank you, Stuart, my father-in-law, for giving me this wonderful project with my son, and, and uh, to teach me how to behave properly in front of him or something, because I've got a... <laughs> <clears throat> dashboard, just go in, dashboard, just fit in this thing. So me and my son, we're, we're at this one particular place, getting this dashboard put together, and I'm taking, there's this little spring that's holding a screw for the, the little glove box that's on there, 
and I'm taking it off, and I'm t- it's not fitting in there right, and I'm kind of pushing on it. And don't you know what? I pop the spring off there. Ah, now what am I going to do? And I put this thing back on, and it's not going on right. So we're fiddling with it, and we just decide, you know what? Tape works. <laughs> now, I have a faithful son. He's a good boy. I'm, I'm proud of that guy as you could possibly be. He said, Dad, let's do it right. I said, oh. How many know the father wants us to do it right? I learned that from my son. Okay, we'll do it right. So I get this little screw, or this little spring, and I drop it down behind this thing. I'm like, well, son, we're going to have to tape it now. There's no way to retrieve it. And then I remembered, my father-in-law bought some really weird tools. I wonder if there's a tool in the box that will do it. And sure enough, you know, we've all seen those little springy tools with the all twisting. You push the button on the side, and it's got a little claw that comes out. That's what that's for. When dingbats like me drop screws in places they're not supposed to be, you use this tool. Sam's holding the flashlight. I'm trying to grab this thing. After a certain amount of time, I'm going to say how long, we retrieved the spring, and we put it back together. And we got the, the glove box fixed. We figured out we had to take it apart again, put another piece in there, and then it worked. And me and my son, we sat there, and the rest of the bike is still torn apart, but we got this glove box on. <laughs> and we had the front end of the glove box. We sat back, and we, I tell you, I, could, I should be up for the Nobel Prize. <laughs> it was such a major accomplishment for us. We sat back, and we just high-fived each other. We like, we did this because we didn't go second rate. We decided to do the job right. How many know the Lord wants us to do the job right? The prophetic he has called us to is such a marvelous gift. It's such a great tool in the toolbox. It's such a wonderful thing. But how many know that it's just one of the tools in the toolbox? How many know that God is speaking to all his body right now? You don't have to be a prophet to hear. How many know he's still speaking to apostles? And we need to listen. How many know he's still speaking to evangelists? How many know he's still speaking to pastors? How many know he's still speaking to teachers? Prophets is one of them. I don't know why their spouses are left off of that list of the fivefold, but spouses, how many know he's speaking to you through spouses still? Listen, he's speaking to the body of Christ. The tools that he's given us, we must learn to use them properly. Amen? We need the fathers. We need their voice. Amen. We need this. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. I am going to get to scripture. I promise I'm not just going to tell stories the whole time. I've been noticing something in the body of Christ. And and I need to just say a few things here. And and I am getting into my message, so don't worry. But But as we get into understanding what the Father has for us, we have to learn that we must be faithful stewards. If we're going to be faithful when he comes back. How many know that this is the house of the Lord? And he's called us. Come on. Do we know that this is the house of the Lord? Yes. We are the house of the Lord. And not just this building, but us in the building. We are the house of the Lord. As the house of the Lord, how many know he's calling us to be faithful stewards over his house? It's not our house. It's his house. I don't want his house to be messy when he comes back. I don't want things to be all torn apart and everything to be, be gross. I want him to come back and be good job. You guys took care of my house. Nice. Good job. I like it. The roof's done. The the floor's done. The foundation is solid. Great job, guys. Look at Matthew 24, starting verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler? Say ruler. Ruler. Say it louder. Say ruler. Ruler. Faithful master, or uh, whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season. How many know it's our job to feed those in his house? We're the servants. We're feeding those in his house. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Do one more verse here. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler, say ruler, over all his goods. Now, let's just look there. Now, you can read on there and and, and realize that if you're an evil... Steward, oh man, trouble's coming for you if you're not faithful with his house. I want to stress the importance of us, how important it is for us to be faithful over his house. I'm not doing this so that he can make me ruler over lots of other stuff. I'm doing this because I want to please the Father. How many want to please the Father? 
I want to please the Father. I want to make him happy. I want him to see that I'm doing a good job. I love that, like, like Todd pointed out, you know, we've been, as uh, the prophetic arm of these kingdom quakes, as this prophetic troop and different things, it's been amazing working over the, with these guys over the last couple of years because we, I've seen that the Lord hasn't, hasn't just started right now since, since all this stuff in the politics and all this stuff. It's not just now that we got it. We noticed a long time ago it's time to fix this thing. It's time to right the ship. It's time to get things in order. And so we, we have to, right now it's, it's pretty neat because right now the Lord's like put his finger on the button right now. And he said, okay, let's amp it up, guys. Let's get, let's get ready to get this ship righted in the proper way. The prophetic needs a facelift. And I want to say this to us, just because part of my gift is, most of my gift is exhortation. If you can't, can't figure that out yet already, I want to exhort you. You're going to be exhorted by the time you're done. Okay? I promise you. If you're not, it's Todd's fault. Exhort means to encourage, to build up, to strengthen, to feel the passion being transferred. It's, we're exhorting you. I'm exhorting you to, to good works, to action, to do the, what the, the Lord's calling me. And nobody's doing more things than I'm doing myself. I know that myself, I've got a lot of things in my life that need to get the ship righted. I need to get things in order. I need to get the right tools out so I can find that screw so I can fix the thing right. We need to lose, if you're writing things down, write this down. If you're not writing things down, get a marker out and write it on your neighbor's arm. We need to lose confidence in our natural abilities and gain confidence in our supernatural ability. Now listen, there's many of us here that are gifted in natural things in, in many ways, and God gave us those giftings. But we, we've turned, we, we've, we put too much bank in those things when God wants his kingdom to shine through us, he's given us supernatural abilities beyond what you can do. Those are the things that we need to begin to focus on. Let's lose our natural, or let's, let's lose confidence, I want to say, in our natural abilities and gain confidence in our supernatural abilities. I, was, I love history. My undergraduate degree is in history. And I've been looking at, at this... Uh, the Second Great Awakening. How many know the Second Great Awakening? And I've been seeing some parallels with the Second Great Awakening and with what's happening now. Basically, the Second Great Awakening from like 1795 all the way to like 1835, 1850-ish, in that range. You know, you have guys like Charles Finney, amazing. Timothy Dwight. These guys were preachers of repentance, man. It was a repentance awakening, right? Calling the church. People had stopped going to church. People had stopped because there was this, this national thing going through America called rationalism. Sound familiar? Think we're dealing with any rational, rationalistic mentality? That's the soul trying to creep up to tell us stuff. That's man's reasoning. It's humanistic philosophy. It's garbage. It's garbage. When it gets in the church, it stinks terrible. Because the church is not supposed to be man-centered reasoning. It's supposed to be God-centered reasoning. And when we get back and we write the ship, we get back to this place of God-centered reasoning, we'll start to see repentance come as a result of that. The other thing that was popular during, was just taking people out during the second, uh, the great, second Great Awakening was this thing called transcendentalism, right? Henry David Thoreau was on the scene. And if you know who he was, he wrote books, hey, divinity is in the trees. Let's go live in Walden Pond and worship the water and the whatever. Sound familiar? Hey, are we dealing with that same spirit? Listen, the devil has the same tactics that he uses over and over. But we've got to wisen up, church. We've got to be, we've got to stand against these crazy principles that the, that the world's trying to throw at us. We got all this transgender stuff. We got all this, all this stuff that the world's throwing at us. Listen, the issue is not let's try to identify more garbage in the earth. It's let's keep our eyes focused on Jesus. If we can keep our eyes focused on the Father and his message, then all that stuff, we'll start to have an answer before you even know what the garbage is. The world is looking for an answer. They're looking for hope. I was, I don't know, if I tell too many stories, I'll get myself in trouble and I won't get to the word. But I was, I was out, uh, let's see, it was daddy-daughter dance, mid-February, mid about a month ago. I was with a... Uh, um, 
and my daughter, and we were out to dinner and before the dance, and we invited her friend and her father, who is like the spiritual director at uh, the school she goes to. It's a Baptist school. Praise God. Somebody say praise God. Praise God. Praise God. These Baptists, man, they love souls, don't they? Man, they love souls. This guy, he's spirit-filled, but I won't tell anybody. <laughs> so we're out to dinner, and, and, and we're just having a good time talking and getting ready. And he used, and so the waitress comes over, takes our order, and, and uh, he's about to hand the menu to the waitress, and she grabs it to take it, and he kind of holds it there. Like, oh, man. He's, and I knew exactly what he was about to do. He's using this menu to preach the gospel, I guarantee you. He's about to smack her upside the head with the word of God. And this is exactly what he did. He said, and he said it in the, in the greatest way. He said, listen, we're about to pray for our food here. What can we pray for you about? Just as cleanly and as, just as, as, as great as that. And instantaneously, this woman just broke. And, and it, was, it was such a, a powerful thing because she said, well, I, just was, I just moved to Toledo. I don't know anybody. I got, you know, I, I, have a, my, I moved up here to help take care of my, my best friend, Rose, who's got cancer. Can we please pray for her? And we went into this amazing prayer, okay? And it was, she's crying, she's bawling, and the Lord starts, and, and, and so she goes, he's just saying, well, I come to church this week, you know, and he's invited. You know what my soul did? My soul, oh, man, she's going to a Baptist church. <laughs> That's how crummy my soul still is. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But I know, I'm sad. It was so sweet, though, to see the Spirit of God moving. Listen, the world is hungry. They are ripe. Listen, if we just lift up our eyes and look right now, the fields are white. Aren't they white right now? They're white under harvest. They're ready for us to just be spiritual, just to be what God's called us to be. We don't have to be stand up and be a national prophet. I'm going to use all my social media platforms, and I'm about to... We don't have to do all that. We don't have to get up and start declaring all this. Stuff. We just have to live how the Lord has called us to live. We have to live in the right way, in the right modes, the right mentality. Let's get into some scriptures here so we know what those are. Amen. The Lord, love, the Lord believes in his kingdom. Amen. And he, I want to tell you this something. Not that we don't already know this, but you know that the chess game has already been won. Calvary won the chess game. The devil's still playing. He, I don't know why, but he's still playing. But he's just playing with pawns. He's still thinking he's got a, he's his only chance. He's still trying to take some people out. But how many know the king, his king is already down. He already lost the battle. So we've got to be wise in how we're handling this thing. I had a, I'm not getting scriptures. Turn, go, go real quick to just the Matthew chapter 11. And this is part of hearing the Father's voice, saints. So when, when, when that brother did that with the waitress, the Lord began to speak to me and said, how come you can't do that? And I said, oh, I can do that. I, I, I don't even mind talking to strangers. <laughs> I love doing that. And so I'm a little embarrassed to tell you how many times I've done that already since it's only been a month, and I've probably done it a dozen times. That's how many times I've been out to eat. But waitresses, and I've, I've had more opportunities in the last month to share Christ with people just because I learned in, in a brief moment, in a brief minute, that this is what the Father wants. And I've come to a place of rest about it. I've come to a place of peace about it. That word, Joanna had, peace in the storm. There's all this stuff brooding. There's all this junk going on. But guess what? There's peace. If you get your eyes focused on me, I'm a God of peace. I remember Matthew 11 here, verse 28. Jesus says one of the most famous things that we've heard all, all of our life, and we love it. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. rest. Say rest. rest. Man, I tell you what, sometimes my soul gets me heavy laden. I'm listening to it. I'm letting it guide me. I'm not letting the word divide I'm letting that soul speak to me, but I know that I can come to him anytime and get rest. How many know we can get rest? But you know what? It goes a little step further. Verse 29 says, take, say take, take. my yoke upon you and learn from me. Say learn from me. 
Man, I'll tell you what, this is instructive for us. This is Jesus talking. This is the Father speaking to us. If he says we can take his yoke and learn from him, guess what happens? Uh, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest. Say find. find. Well, find rest. I remember listening to the Brother David also book preach on this scripture. I, think I heard him preach it here at this church. He preached on this, the given rest and the found rest. There's two types of rest. You can have the given rest of God all day long. He's faithful to give it to you every time you come to him. He's going to give you rest. But I want the found rest. Because if I can get to the place where I find, if I'm learning from him, if I'm taking his yoke, which means I'm keeping my eyes fixed on him, if I'm looking at him and I'm taking on his yoke, then I am finding rest and I own that rest. That rest becomes mine. I want that kind of rest. How many want that kind of rest? That's what that word is. Peace. Rest. He's given you this. You just have to come and learn from him. Let's get the ship righted so that we can learn what true rest is all about. Amen? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He loves us so much. It's the found rest of God. Turn with me quickly to Matthew, or I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 4. Let's get into this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse, starting in verse 11. We must learn how to separate between the soul and spirit. And Pastor George has been preaching on this. Um, I don't know, he's been for a couple years, it seems like. But, but he's, been, he's been helping us see this thing. And the Lord started to show me some things out of here that I've never seen before. In verse 11, let us therefore say, no, don't say anything yet. Let us therefore be diligent, say diligent, diligent. to enter the rest, say the rest. Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Listen, the disobedience was they didn't trust what, the, what those guys told them when they came out. We can take this land. We can go in there and get this arm. Don't fall in the, the wilderness like the rest of the Israelites do. We can take this. Don't fall. He's saying be diligent to enter the rest. Don't fall. But be diligent to enter the rest. For the word of God. Say the word of God. Living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit and joints and marrow, and as a discerner, say discerner, discerner. of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And, <laughs> yeah, you can keep saying the word. That's always good. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to his eyes of him who we must give account. Listen, I'm talking to prophetic people here tonight. We must learn to discern the word of God. The word that the Lord has given you, the word that you're speaking from this microphone, the word that you're typing on Facebook, the word that you're sending out on social media, we must have a discerning heart. You must learn how to have a discerning heart. You can't just, you can't, we, we can't just do, we can't just, oh, the Lord, the Lord dropped something in my spirit. I'm going to share it with the world. Hey, let's scrutinize it a little bit. Let's scrutinize that word. Let's discern over that word. How many know that it's good to discern the word of the Lord? The word says in, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 29, it says, let two or three prophesy and let the rest what? Judge. Judge is good. Judge is not bad. Being judged in your prophetic word is not bad. That's a good thing. I love being judged in my prophetic word. I was with Pastor George. We were doing a school of the Holy Spirit in eastern Ohio. And we were at a, a camp thing that they were doing. And he was doing like a prophecy, and he had me up there. This is a long time ago, too. We were up there prophesying and, and having a good time. And I noticed this guy sitting over in the corner. And I, he was being what I would consider at the time. I was a young man, probably with real little kids. And I thought he was being pretty rough with his kids. Something, this, I'm telling you about a mistake I made. So get ready. So I, I, something dropped in my spirit. Like, oh, man, how, how should I, you know, I, something didn't set well with my soul, not my spirit. My soul didn't like it. And so I, I, I decided to, you know, I was going to minister to this guy, and I called him out, and I began to prophesy over him. And I'm, I'm my spirit, or not my spirit, my soul already kind of thought, ah, this guy, I don't like the way he was doing this thing. So I, I went the opposite direction, and I started saying, oh, man, the Lord, the Lord wants you to know that he loves your fatherhood, and he thinks you're just, he, he's going to help you to grow in this thing. He's going to help. I gave him this real flowery, ooey-gooey prophecy. And we, we got done, and we went back to the room we were staying in, me and Pastor George. And uh, 
Pastor Rose said, hey, but you did good prophesying tonight. That was good. Except for that one guy, and you know who I'm talking about. And I immediately knew, man, I blew it again. He said, you, you prophesied an ooey-gooey message over that guy. He goes, I saw what he was doing with this kid's school. You immediately let your soul come in and begin to speak to you about how you should prophesy that guy. And he was right. And I had, and I had to go and apologize to the guy the next day and, and I made it right with the leaders that were there. And, and, this, and you know, I felt great afterwards. It wasn't a hard thing to be judged. It wasn't a hard thing for me to come out. I wasn't embarrassed. I learned. Guess what? I learned so much. If I, if I hadn't been judged like that, if I hadn't had a caring father help me to discern between my soul and my spirit, I might still be making those kind of mistakes. I want to encourage you, saints. Listen, prophetic people here, get into the place, get into relationship with real fathers that know how to judge you, that know how to help you, that know how to encourage you in your gifting, in your walking, so that when you are out there doing the stuff, you can discern between that soul and that spirit. This is what it's there for. We need to get to that place. Listen, I love to have my words read this. How many know that the Lord does not think about correction like we think about correction? We think correction is a bad thing. How many know he loves? He loves those he corrects. He loves he, his, his kids. If he's, if he's not correcting you, well, then you've got a problem. Listen, I want to give my father a nice house when he comes back. Amen? I want to give him something that he can be proud of. We must be focused on the word of the Lord. Our soul wants to be more concerned with our comforts, uh, the, the political breaks that we want. I want this person in office. I want this. I want my tax breaks. I want my cushy lifestyle. That's the soul. That's what the soul does to us. The soul, and so we start to speak things that are not true because we are too busy with that. The soul also is in disunity. And, and that's a, a, an unfortunate thing that I see in the body of Christ right now. I see a lot of disunity in the body of Christ. People have opinions about this. They have opinions about that. Listen, saints, the Lord, you know, the anointing will not flow upon his house if it's not unified. The anointing flows down when his people come together and are unified together and are about one purpose. We've got to be about restoring relationship. And we've got, like, I like what Caleb said earlier, we've got to be adults about a lot of stuff that's happening in the church today. we just got to learn to love one another past our differences so that we can see the anointing fall upon his church again. How many know the Lord wants to pour out his spirit in unmeasured ways so that it's, it's as great as when the waters cover the seas? His glory will, will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's what he wants. I love the peace that came when me and Sam found that, that little screw, that little, that little spring. We, we found a level of peace and unity. And learning how to hear the Father's voice will bring peace, even if it's corrective in nature. 1 John, go with me in your Bibles, 1 John chapter 4. The Lord is speaking, but we must turn down the noise of our soul and our carnal desires. In verse 17. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Boldness in the day of judgment. Listen, when we stand before the Lord, there's going to be a judgment. I want to be able to stand with boldness before the Lord and be confidence. I want to have confidence when I stand before the Lord. The only way that's going to happen is if I judge myself now. Come on. The only way that's gonna, I'm going to be able to do that, listen, I don't want to not be judged. I don't want to be in this place where I'm going to be standing before the Lord someday and not, and go, but oh man, I hope uh, Matthew 7, which is, you know, Lord, Lord, many of us will come to him that day, you know, and say, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not done this? Have we not done that? Depart from me, workers of iniquity. I don't even know who you are. Listen, saints, the prophetic voice must be we must get to the place where we are allowing ourselves to be judged, allowing ourselves to be scrutinized, allowing ourselves to be in that place where we can be corrected. And I know this is kind of heavy, but you know, the reality of it is correction's a good thing, judgment's a good thing, and if we get to the place where we do this, I can stand with boldness in the day of judgment. And I want to stand there because as he is, so are we in this world, right? 
We are the embodiment of Christ Jesus. We all know the scripture. Revelation 19.10. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus. What's the testimony of Jesus? He gave his life. He surrendered it all. He shed his blood. That's the testimony of Jesus. That's the spirit of prophecy. Listen, here's the, here's the point for us. The spirit of God, the spirit of prophecy, if it's not lifting up the name of Jesus, stop listening to it. If it's lifting up a false God, if it's, if it's telling you to, to look this way or to look that way, obviously we don't listen to it. But it can be subtle at times, and we've got to learn how to look for those things. I've heard a lot of words in the church that point people to the flesh. Well, go do this and go fight this way and go fight that way. That's not the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God wants to bring unity, wants to bring, bring us into a place of knowing that Jesus is the only one we should be looking at. As he is, so are we in this world. We don't have to be afraid of the enemy. We don't have to be afraid of, his, of his, what he's doing to us. Right there, just jump over to chapter 5 and look in verse, uh, verse 18. We know that whoever is born of God, how many is born of God in here? You, you know you're born of God. You know you're already your address is in heavenly places. Okay, you've been born of heaven. We've been born of God. We are children of another realm. We're children. We already, our address is already there. We are in that place. Whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. Listen, when we are walking in the Spirit, when you are listening to the Father's voice, when you are allowing him, the enemy, to, to speak to you, the enemy cannot touch you. He can't get to you. Listen, I, we, we've seen too many people get bombarded from the enemy. I have a neighbor named Bob. And Bob is, he's a good man. We just moved in this house a, a year and a half ago. And Bob is, I would consider him probably the most nosiest guy I've ever met in my life. I mean, literally, like, he walks to my backyard looking in the windows of our house, and we're like, oh, I'm just checking on things, making sure everything's okay. I'm like, Bob. <laughs> At first, I didn't like Bob. I was like, Bob's going to have to, he's going to have to go in his own yard. He's going to have to get out of my yard here. But he was, he's always told us, well, there was, you know, I always had to check on this property and make sure it was taken care of and all this kind of stuff. So the Lord started speaking to me and said, you need to win Bob. I said, I don't know how to win Bob. He's, he's an older man. He lives by himself. He's, he's as crude and crass as they come. I'm telling you, Jennifer, my wife can tell you, he's a, he's a character. He, he's, he's just lived a life. He's been a single man most of his life, and, and uh, he's got a lot of opinions about a lot of things. And, and he's, he's damaged by our culture right now. Pretty serious ways. He can't leave his house because he's got health issues. So so he can't get out there and, and, and do the things that he used to do. So the Lord started speaking to me, you got to be the guy that he, that he learns to trust. So I started last year, you know, we'd, we'd start talking, and Bob would come to the fence. And you guys remember that show, Home Improvement, where you saw Wilson halfway? And that's <laughs> literally what it was, you know, Bob's ha head's halfway over the fence. And we're talking and communicating. We're, we're trying to do all this kind of stuff. And, and he's, you know, he's crass, you know. And, and Bob, I'm a pastor, you know what I mean? I, I, you know, I've heard... You know, coarse language before, but I'd appreciate it if you could, you know, keep it to a minimum at least. You know, <laughs> you can't catch himself half the time. And so we're talking, and we're actually making good friends with the guy, and and we're doing well. And so, as we're as we're going through life, he starts to call me all the time. Randy, I, I need help with this. Randy, I need help with that. I'm just trying to be a Christian man to him. I'm just trying to 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 open up my heart to him. And guess what? God starts to open up his heart. I was able to lead him to the Lord. had him on the speakerphone sitting at our dinner, dinner table. He called me to tell me something else Trump did. And <laughs> we're sitting around my table, and, I, and we're eating dinner. And I said, Bob, you're on speakerphone. And he's like, I don't care. You know, I just don't know what to do with all this. And I said, Bob, it's, he said, hey, tell me about this surrendering your life again. And I told him, I said, it's just about Christ. You know, you got to surrender to Christ. Well, I do believe in Jesus. I do. And I let him through the whole thing. Do you believe that he died for you? That his blood is good enough to cover you. He, I don't think he can cover my sins, Randy. Blank, blank, blank. My sins are pretty blank, blank, blank. I know. <laughs> but he can cover them if you let him. <laughs> and he accepted Christ. And he said, okay, well, I want that. 
and we lead them to the Lord. Saints, this is an opportunity that we have. We, the world is hungry. The world wants to know. We have, to, as a prophetic voice, we have opportunities. Say we have opportunities. We just have to be sensitive to what the Father is doing. Amen? I, uh, I love this. Um, there's a, um, in 2 Kings chapter 6, we know the story. I'm not, we're not going to take the time to read it to us all. Um, but in 2 Kings chapter 6, we know the story of Elijah and his servant. Elisha, sorry, and his servant. You know, there was a uh, king in Israel. You know, they told the king, you know, somebody's given away all of our secrets to the Syrian guy. And he said, well, there's a prophet in Israel. He knows what the king's doing in his bedroom. Go get this guy. He's got to be the one selling my secrets away. So go get this guy. So he sends an army after Elijah. Elijah's in Dothan. And the servant is there. And he sees the people coming. And they're surrounded. They got chariots, all this kind of stuff. And what's Elisha's response? Or Elisha's response? He says, Lord, open his eyes. Let him see that there's greater with us than against us. And he opens his eyes. And what does he see? The, the, the hills are surrounded with chariots of fire and angelic hosts. Saints, we, we're on the winning side. We're on the winning side. We have the winning ticket. The world is hungry, and we've just got to open our eyes and see what the Father sees. Last March, when, when uh, we first, when COVID was starting to hit, and we had to, you know, all the mask mandates and all those stuff started coming down the pike, you know, I, I was frustrated, and I said, Lord, what, what's going on? I mean, what's, what's happening to the church? I mean, are we, are we going down this wrong path and all this kind of stuff? And the Lord says, you're looking at the wrong thing. You're looking at, you're looking at circumstances. You're looking at, you know, mandates and all this kind of stuff. Keep your eyes on me. And I had this vision of the Lord as a general up on a hill, and there's a big battle raging beneath him. And he's sitting on the stone. He's just relaxed. He's at peace. He's totally calm. He's got, you know, kind of a general's outfit on, and and I saw, as he's watching this, you know, like butterflies are flying around. I mean, just all this peaceful scene. And here's this horrible war raging beneath him. And I saw people going up the hill and talking to him, and then they'd come back down. And, go, and I said, I wonder if I can do that. And so I ran up the hill, and I started talking to the Lord. And I said, Lord, you know, how, what's, the, what's the key here? And he said, be at peace. And he breathed on me. And I just felt the peace of the Lord come upon my soul. And he said, now go back and lead my people. And if you keep your eyes on me, you're going to overcome you're not going to lose this battle. And everybody that was just at peace, they were the ones conquering. And they weren't afraid of anything. They weren't afraid of, of, of what was happening around them. And they, weren't, they were keeping their eyes on the prize. 1 Corinthians 14. Get to a little bit of nuts and bolts here for us. This is a, you know, when we talk about prophecy, this is one of the greatest scriptures that we can turn to. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. Pursue love. Say pursue love. He just preached the whole love chapter of, of chapter 13. You know, love is great. And desire. Say desire. desire. Spiritual gifts. Pursue love. Desire spiritual gifts. But especially, say especially, desire. that you may prophesy. Oh, I love that. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Amen? Amen? For no one understands him. Say that, say that with me. Say no one understands him. No one understands. I, I get in a lot of talks with Baptists lately, and that's fine because my kids go to a Baptist school. But I get in, and they're like, oh, you know, if you're going to speak in tongues, you know, they, they, it's got to be a foreign language. You know, listen, my language, nobody understands my language. I guarantee you. My word says, I don't know what your Bible says, but my word says no one understands. There's not somebody out there that can figure out what you're saying. It's got to be interpreted via the Spirit of God. When we were prophesying earlier, when the prophecy was going, immediately my heart starts to speak in tongues, and I start to pray it out loud because I want to I sow the ground with spiritual things. Amen? For no one understands them. However, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. I want to speak the mysteries of God, and we have to sow into our spirit those mysteries because prophecy is a mystery. Somebody say Amen. It says, but he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. Now, we know that exhortation means builds and supports. It's a foundational, or I'm sorry, edifying means builds, supports, and it's a foundational thing. Exhorts 
is in the encouraging and the correction and comfort is not counseling. Prophets, listen to me. When we're prophesying over people, we're not counseling them. We're just delivering the word of the Lord. Amen? It's not a counseling thing. It's a comforting thing. The Holy Spirit wants to bring comfort and encouragement. Edifies the church. Say the church. Who is, what's prophecy for? Who is it for, I should say? The church. So I want to say something here. <laughs> Listen, I know of maybe a handful of people that I've ever met in my life that I would say have the gift to be able to prophesy to the nations. That's a very specific gift that the Lord has called. And there are certain people that have that gifting. But I want to tell you that the prophecy, the New Testament prophecy that we have, it's for us in the church. We're to speak edification, exhortation, comfort to the church so we can build up the church. Why are we building up the church? Because we are, have the manifold wisdom of God right here in the church. He's making known the manifold wisdom of God to the church so that we can speak that to the principalities and powers. But it must come through the scrutiny, it must come through the judgment of the church prophecy so that we can understand how to deliver that message. Amen? Amen. This is New Testament prophecy, saints. It's for the church. We can easily deduce that just by looking at these scriptures. I wish, verse 5 says, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church, say the church, may receive edification. Amen? I, uh, I was looking at um, Jeremiah Johnson, and he's got a, a video out, and he said a couple things, and I, I was looking at the stuff that he was talking about, Todd, and some of these things, and he's got the New Testament prophet's role, and I'm just going to touch on three real quick, what the New Testament's role of the prophet are. Because I found, so he wrote this with um, Lauren Sanford. And Lauren and Jeremiah got this from his father, John Sanford. And John Sanford, who wrote the Elijah task, if you've never read that, Prophets, it's a great book to read. And Elijah Among Us is the follow-up to that. But then I, I looked at even further, and John Sanford was looking at some things that Dick Iverson had wrote and had identified about the prophet. And that's just as far as I could get. I bet you people have been writing about this stuff for, all, for a long time. But the New Testament prophecy, what's it for? Who's it for? Listen, number one, it's to direct. New Testament prophecy directs us. It directs people to the person of Jesus Christ. If it's not doing that, don't listen to that word. It must do that. In some way, shape, or form, it has to direct people to Jesus Christ, to his lordship and his rule. Revelation 19.10, again, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The second thing it does is it corrects. And it must, we, correction means it brings the body of Christ back to a place of repentance and true holiness, back into a relationship with Christ. Listen, this is what prophecy is, saints. This is what it should do. I found that in those words that were prophesied tonight. They were bringing us back to a place of calling us, back to a relationship with God. It's not difficult, but it has to be managed properly. If we're letting other things come in, then we're going to get ourselves in trouble and we're going to start saying things that aren't true, that bring confusion in people's life. One of the things I do as a pastor is I work with people and their prophecies all the time. And I go through, I had, a, I had a brother in my office the other day and he had a stack of prophecies with him and he laid them on the table and he says, Randy, I don't know what to do with all these prophecies and some of them make sense, some of them don't. And I said, well, let's go through them. And I get out my red pen. And I start looking at these prophecies. And I start looking at this, and I said, Does this, is this what this guy's saying over you? Does, and this guy jumps around from church to church, and he gets prophecies from every Tom, Dick, and Harry he can find. And I said, does this, does this qualify with your spirit? Well, not right now, but maybe. I said, whoop, went through an X, right through it. Nope. And you can do that. And I went through half his prophecies. I got rid of probably two-thirds of them. And, and by the end of it, he's looking at me, and he's looking at these prophecies. He says, here's the ones. Now, let's look at the ones that we didn't throw away. These words here, how do they feel? Well, they encouraged and edified and built them. Now, these are the prophecies that we go to war with. These are the prophecies that the Word of God is confirming in your heart. We have to get to that place where it's okay to do that, saints. And it's okay to let it be done to you. My father, man, when I was a young teenager, you know, he... he 
he'd uh, hand me prophesying, and I'd go up there, and I'd have a word. And for years, he'd, he'd say, write down your prophecy. And I'd write down my prophecy and hand it to him, and he'd, he'd look at it, and he'd literally do that with a red pen. He'd say, nope, nope, nope. And then he'd hand it back and say, you can go say this. I said, okay. <laughs> and I'd read it. What, what did he leave left? The Lord wants you to know that he loves you. <laughs> that's, not tr- that's true. And for years, I have notebooks still at home of, of things. And he made me personally, he didn't make me, but he encouraged me to do personal journaling. For about five years, all I did was journal. Every day, I would journal. He would go through my journals, and he would help me discern what was God and what wasn't. Now, that's a blessing to have a father like that. I realize that. You know, not everybody has a, has a father that's willing to train like that. But we need to let ourselves be discerning like that to get ourselves into that place as well. Lord, discern my heart. Look at my words. And when I, and I journal today, and still to this day, I go through prophecies with people. I remember the day I, I handed him a prophecy, and I said, this is what I want to say. He looked, and he said, oh, that's pretty good. He said, okay, I'll go prophesy. And he crumbled up the paper and threw it away. And I said, man, I said, I just wrote, that was a beautiful word. He said, yeah. He said, Randy, it's inside of you now. Let it go. And I went up there with that microphone, and I just started prophesying the word of God. And he was building confidence in me. He, he realized I did that to my nephew a couple weeks ago. He came up with a prophecy. He said, hey, Uncle Randy, is this a good word? I said, yeah, that's really good, Jay. Let's go hear it. He said, well, I need my paper. I said, no, you don't. And he went up there and he prophesied. And, and he prophesied more than was on the page because that Naba, that Naba flow hit him. You know what Naba is? That, that, that Hebrew word that means bubble up to flow. The Naba flowing of God. And when the speak of the utterance means utterance of God and it begins to bubble up right here. I love prophecy because I can feel it right here. And maybe it's just because I have a big receptor. <laughs> But man, I can, I feel the prophecy of the Lord and I feel it, feel it right here because it's bubbling up in my inner man. Saints, we got to, not only do we have to write the ship in prophecy, but we've got to fall in love with it all over again in a new dynamic way. Somebody say amen. The father loves us. Todd, can you guys come back up and play? I know I went through some of this stuff fast and I know I, I jumped a bit, but I wanted to to get us back to this place. The third thing that Jeremiah talks about is prediction as as far as New Testament prophecy. And he says that this is the least of what prophecy is, and I agree with that. Prediction. And because we've gotten ourselves in trouble, I believe, in the body of Christ and in the world at large because we're predicting everything. I'm predicting this. I'm predicting that. And then people say, oh, I got it wrong. And then... Man, these guys are getting crucified just for, for wanting to do it right, wanting to be rightly judged. You know, you see some of these guys. You guys know what I'm talking about? There are people that have prophesied about that Trump was going to win and different things like that, and then they've come out and apologized because Trump didn't win. And other Christians are attacking these people, giving them death threats. I mean, it's unbelievable what's happening. Prediction is the least bit of what pr- prophecy is all about. If anything about prophecy, it should be like Agabus. How many know who Agabus is? Agabus was a prophet in the New Testament, and he prophesied there was a famine coming to Israel. Prediction, if anything, should be for the church to prepare the church for what the Lord is going to do through the church. That's what prediction is. Not about, you know, I, I'm going to describe to you who's going to win the election and who's going to be this senator and what's going to happen here and what's going to happen there. Again, I know a handful, maybe, of people that can do that kind of prophecy. The prophecy, New Testament prophecy is for us, for the church, so we can build and strengthen one another. And we can grow in the gift and the grace that the Lord has for us so that we can prepare his house. Amen? Amen. This is time for us to prepare the house of the Lord. There's going to be, I believe, and and you might disagree with me, but I believe that that there are two groups of Christians in the earth. There are those that are spirit-led and those that are soul-led. And we've got to get ourselves into that place where we are led by the Spirit. Dial down the soul. Dial down what's happening. There's a Revelation 12 talks about the man-child. Man-child, in my opinion, is a group of overcoming believers, overcoming Christians that are learning to walk in the Spirit. The Bible says they're caught up to heaven. They are they're caught up to the throne of God, and they're given a, a rod of iron to rule with. This man child. The woman has had to be secreted away. I believe it's talking about two types of Christians. I want to be part of the overcomers. Who wants to be an overcomer in life? I want to be an over I want to be led by the Spirit. 
I want to view this thing. And, and turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11 as we close here for this portion. Isaiah chapter 11, <laughs> verse 1. This is a prophecy, obviously, about Jesus, but how many know that we are the testimony of Jesus? We have his marks on us. We are the body of Christ. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Saints, it's time for the church to get the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes. Listen, saints, it's time for us to stop judging by the sight of our eyes and start judging by the spirit of God that's within us. We're looking at all this stuff and we're making judgments. But the general's up on the hill and he's saying, keep your focus here. Because while we're looking at this stuff, we're losing the battle. But if we just look up and see that you got a neighbor, Bob. You got waitresses. You've got the stuff. He put all the tools in the toolbox that you're going to need. We got to get our eyes on the right focus. Get our eyes on the prize. Let the confidence of the Lord build us. And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. Right? But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. The meek shall inherit the what? Just making sure we're reading the same Bible. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Listen, saints, this is a picture, obviously, of our Lord Jesus Christ, but it's the picture of who the Lord is calling us to be. I want to be faithful. Will you stand to your feet with me? I want to be faithful in the house. And I know as prophetic people, you do too. It's time for the faithfulness of the Lord to come forth in, in the hearts of his people like never before. It's time. It's time, saints. Do you agree with me? Yes. Listen to the scripture. This is my closing scripture. Therefore, this is Colossians 3, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. But above, say above, above, above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection and the peace of God, say the peace of God, will rule in your hearts to which also you are called in one body and be thankful. Let's just thank the Lord right now. We just lift up your hands right now. Let's just begin to thank the Lord for his goodness. Let's begin to thank the Lord that he's called us as a prophetic people. Just open your mouth. Just begin to pray. Listen, we're prophetic people. Don't worry about it. Just begin to pray. Just let's intercede for a little bit, saints. Let's just ask the Lord to do something. Let's ask the Lord to come upon our lives. Let's ask the Lord to fill us with his wisdom, with his spirit of counsel, with his spirit of might, with who he is. Thank you, Lord. Let's just begin to pray. Keep praying, saints. Go ahead, pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Let's, let's dig out the mysteries of God right now. Come on, we're Spirit-filled people here. Let's pray. Let's intercede right now. The Lord's got a, a calling for us. The Lord's got something for you to say. You're a prophetic person. Stir up the gift. Stir up the gift right now. Come on. The Lord wants to break out. He's ready. He's ready to break out in your heart right now. He's ready. Let him in. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Fill us with power. Fill us with might. Father, let your church be filled. 
to the fullness of God. We want to hear your voice, oh God. We want to be attentive to the Father, be faithful over the house. Faithful to your house, oh God. Come on, keep praying. We're going to transition into ministry time here in a minute. But let's pray right now. The Lord wants to release the spirit of counsel and the spirit of wisdom. Keep your focus on Him right now. Turn down the soul. Whatever happened at work this week, whatever battles you might be facing, let's exalt the name of the Lord. Let's exalt the name of Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus right now. Look to Him. Look to Him. Come on, saints. Come on, saints. Worship the Lord. Worship the Lord. We will lift up holy hands in His temple, in His house. He's worthy, saints. He's worthy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we marvel at your goodness, oh God. Father, we marvel at your grace, oh God. Father, we are just filled with wonder at who you are. With wonder at your name, oh God. Father, we're praying. I want us to begin to intercede for the church right now. That true prophetic would begin to fall upon the church once again. That true prophetic would fall upon the house of God. Father, we're asking, oh God. Father, we repent for the times we've let the soul come in. We repent, oh God, for the times that we've allowed the, the, all the garbage and all the things that we're seeing. Father, we repent for those things. Father, turn our eyes upon you. We want to hear your voice, Lord. We want to hear what you, the pure word of the Spirit. But Father, right now, come. Ask him right now. Ask him right now. Thank you, Lord. Just let the sweet presence of the Lord build in your heart right now. Thank you, Lord. Just let it come that focus. Keep your focus. Let the word of God, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. This is a command the Lord's gave us. Let's sing. Let's lift up our voice right now. Just lift up your voice. Just lift up your voice. Come on. Hallelujah. Ore abasi ore. Ondare abasi tore. Ondare abasi tore are andare mamma mo. Oi alla basi carre. Ombare abasandare abasi tore. Hallelujah Lord. Hallelujah Lord. We bless your mighty name, oh God. We bless your mighty name, oh God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Do it with all your heart. The Lord's going to start dropping things in your spirit. As you're opening up to the Lord right now, He's going to start dropping things in your spirit right now. This is a prophetic conference. Let's hear from the Lord right now. Let's begin to hear from the Lord. Hallelujah. What's He saying to you? What's He speaking? What's he saying? He's a life-changing word right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm just waiting. I'm being patient. I'm waiting to see. Catch the Spirit. Catch the Spirit. He's hovering. Just like that word came out earlier. He's hovering. Right now, He's hovering. Hovering over your hearts right now. What's He saying? What's He speaking? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. How many can feel the Spirit? How many can feel the Spirit moving? Give me a little wave if you can 
feel the spirit moving. Praise the Lord. Catch him. Let's not let him leave yet. He's a gentleman. Let's be very respectful. This is his house. You're in his house. You are his house. I don't ever want the spirit to leave me. I don't ever want that spirit to go. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Now catch the words that the Lord's beginning to speak to you. Just catch the words. Be one word, might be one phrase. Might be a whole paragraph, might be something you got to write down. Just begin to catch the word. Catch the word right now. Catch it in your spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. When you're in this place of the spirit, you can begin to see things. What are you seeing in the spirit now? What are you hearing? Our desire is to only do what we see the Father doing. Our heart is to only say what we hear the Father saying. Keep your focus. Keep your focus right now. Hallelujah. Just stay in the Spirit. Just begin to pray. Just softly as you're catching something. Are you catching something? Thank you, Lord. How many are hearing the word from the Lord? Don't worry, I'm not going to make you all come up to the microphone. How many are hearing the word of the Lord in your heart? Wave at me if you're hearing the word. Wave at me if the Lord's showing you something, speaking something to you. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to wait just a minute longer. The Lord wants to dump some more things in. He wants to sow some more things in your heart right now. We don't ever have to rush this. We don't ever have to rush the presence of the Lord. Just enjoy it. Just enjoy it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Now wave at me again. If you... If the Lord spoke to you and you heard something or you saw something, give me a wave. Praise the Lord. Now let me ask you a question. What you heard or what you saw, is it comforting? Not at me. I need, I need a little bit of interaction so I know that you're there. I know you're in the spirit. Not at me. Wave at me. Was it comforting? Praise the Lord. Did it bring peace to your heart? Not at me if it did. Some of you, be brave. Did it bring some correction to a faulty thinking? Man, the Lord does that to me all the time. You're thinking wrong, Randy. Thinking with your soul again. How many know that that's good? Did it build you up? Did the Word of God build you up? Did what you see, what you heard, did it build you up? How many heard something for somebody else? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's time, saints. It's time for the church to be spiritual again. It's time for us to be led by the Spirit of God. It's time for His voice to be the voice that we hear, not our voice. This is just a simple simple thing, simple practice that we can do, that we do every day, that most of us do every day. The Lord wants to increase this right now. This man back here in the, in the black hat, there's a calling of God on your life, my friend. The calling of the Lord is upon your life. The Lord wants you to know that he's going to open your mouth and you're going to speak things that you can't possibly imagine ever coming out of your mouth. 
declaring things that you can't ever possibly imagine that you would be declaring. Things about the nature of Christ that you don't even know, that you're going to begin to speak. And there's people watching you. There's people looking. There's people drawing you. And you're being drawn into the presence of God. The Lord wants you to know that His hand is upon your life. His grace is upon your life. For I would say unto you this day that I am going to take you on an adventure with me. The likes of which you can't possibly imagine. And if you will surrender your whole heart and you will surrender everything to me, I will show you things. I will show you the mysteries of the kingdom. For I long to show you those things. I long to bring you into a place of knowing me and knowing my heart like never before. But I'm drawing you. I'm drawing you and I'm pulling out things There's some things in the past. The Lord says, I'm pulling out those things. I'm cleaning up some things so that I can make you into the man that I've called you to be. The Lord loves you and his hand is upon you, my brother. I bless you in the name of Jesus. What's your name? Luke. Bless you, Luke. I just said that for the tape so you can listen to it later. Bless you, Luke. Let's reach our hands towards Luke right now. This is what spiritual people do. This is what we get to do. We get to participate with the Lord. Father, we bless Luke in the name of Jesus. Father, we speak forth the words of Christ over his heart and over his mind. Father, we call forth the things that are not as though they are, Father God, and we bring him, Father God, by the Spirit into the man that you've called him to be. Father, we believe it. Father, we just release your grace upon our brother right now in the name of Jesus. You just receive that, Luke. Just receive it. I know we can't always get around to people right now. We're trying to be respective of the COVID stuff. How many know the spirit knows no boundaries? Just receive from the Lord, just for another minute here. (laughs) Bless you, Scalia. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Joanna, the Lord's going to increase that gift even more. He's going to begin to breathe on it. He's going to give you things to write down. He's going to give you articles to write. He's going to give you things that begin to put on paper that's going to be instructive, that's going to be helpful to the body of Christ. He's going to show you things. He's going to show you these mysteries, and you're going to help make it plain for people to see and people to understand. His hand is upon you, and he wants to birth that gift and bring that gift into into an even greater level in him. Amen? Praise the Lord. Father, reach your hands toward Joanna right now. Father, we bless Joanna. Father, we call forth the gift of God that is within her, Lord God. Father, we ask you to to increase that gift and pull out that gift right now. Father, into greater mother's measures in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Just receive from the Lord right now. Right now, the Lord wants to do just another another deposit in your heart right now. There's some people that that have come in with some illnesses. Right now, let's just ask the Lord, whatever it might be. Ask the Lord. Somebody's been having um, some, this week has been having some tremendous irregular heartbeats. The Lord wants to heal that right now. The Lord wants to heal that right now. If that's something that you're dealing with, wave at me. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, right now, Lord God. Come, Lord Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Do you have something? Let the Lord touch an area of your body right now. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. The spirit knows no bounds. I want to pray for my friend Abby Evans. Right now, in the name of Jesus. Father, we rebuke cancer. In all its forms, we command. Come on, saints. Let's have some faith right now. We command cancer to die. We command it to die right now in the name of Jesus. It cannot live. The calling of God is on her life. The Spirit of God is upon her. We declare cancer-free, miracle of God. We stand in faith. Let's stand in faith together. Sister Mary, just wave your hand right now. That's her, Mary's daughter, Abigail. 
Father, we bless Abby right now in the name of Jesus, Father God, and we just release the power of God upon those hands. Even though I know she's been prayed for and spoken, Father, we just come together as your church, oh God. Do the work of the Spirit right now, the church of the living God. We speak it right now in faith. How many can see cancer dying? You might know somebody else right now. Let's rebuke cancer right now in the name of Jesus. Rebuke it right now. It has to die. It cannot live. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. How many know the Lord is good? How many know the Lord has got a word for you? How many know let's turn down the soul a little bit? That's a lot of it. Let's turn it off. Joints in the marrow. He's going to divide between the joints and the marrow. The joint is that hard bone that takes life and needs it. The marrow is the life-giving source. That marrow, oh man, we love that marrow. I think Pastor George is telling us the, the marrow produces 90 billion red blood cells a day that bring oxygen to the rest of the body. It also produces white blood cells that kill all disease. That's their job. It goes to attack diseases in our body. Father, I pray that the white blood cells in the saints of the Most High God would be the most effective white blood cells. Amen. The Spirit of God. You created us perfect in your image, oh God. We were created by you. Hallelujah. We want to we wanna break up into ministry teams. I'm going to ask that those that are on the ministry, is, am I turning this over to somebody right now? Matt, yes. Awesome. We're going to turn it over to Brother Matt. Eberly's going to come up, and you can be seated for a minute, probably. Amen. God bless you. Praise the Lord. In the spirit of what is happening still in this room, we would like to continue and offer a time of ministry. And what that's going to look like in our COVID kind of need of um, being sensitive and um, social distancing and things along those lines, what we have decided to do is we have a team of six groups and they will be strategically placed in the room. We'll have two in the corners up front. We'll have one on each side and then we'll have two groups in the back. And the intent is um, that we would like to be spirit led. How many would like for the prayer teams to be spirit led this evening? And what that means is, is that we would like to obviously Pray as the Spirit leads. This isn't necessarily an opportunity to receive prophecy, but I can tell you that there are instances when that occurs. My suggestion would be that if you are desiring to receive prayer, bring your phone. If you know how to use the recording on it, to use that as well. There may be an opportunity when uh, the Spirit moves that, that, that a word could come forth. I, I just want to emphasize that our heart and desire has been for the last three years, the integrity of the prophetic. And what that means is that we really uh, need to emphasize that we only speak that which we hear the Father speak. And we wanna be in that place where we're only doing that which we see the Father doing. And we wanna only lift up the name of Jesus and that is our heart for this evening as well. So with that, what I'd like to do is ask for the groups, the, the leaders and your team to just take up a position as far as either on the side or in the corners in the front or in the corners in the back. And then as you guys are desiring to receive prayer, you can uh, move to any of those groups uh, as you feel led, amen? Father, we continue to just ask for your spirit we continue to invite your presence. Lord, we honor you and lift your name up. 
and ask for the Holy Spirit just to minister as you will. Lord, I pray for these prayer teams that they would have your anointing, your spirit, and, and Father, that you would minister into the deep recesses of hearts this evening, that you would be lifted up, and Lord, that, that there would be uh, individuals who would be comforted, they would be exhorted, Lord, they would be encouraged, Lord, that uh, whatever it is that you desire for uh, this evening, that your will would be done. Yours alone, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.